Hey, C3, thank you for hanging out with us today. And if it's your first time watching and joining us online, man, I just want to say welcome. Uh, thank you for choosing to spend some time with us this morning. It's our prayer that this will be helpful and beneficial to your life. And if it is your first time, at the end of the message in just a moment, I'm going to tell you uh, how you can get a free gift because I would love to be able to send that to you. And then those of you that are part of C3, I want to thank everybody that's a part of C3 that's investing financially in what God's doing through C3. In the last three Sundays, just the last three Sundays in the room on Sunday mornings, we've seen 21 people commit their lives to Christ, which is incredible. And so I want to encourage you as you invest financially in C3 to know that you're investing in life change. You can text C3 Orlando to 77977. You'll get a safe and secure link and you can invest in what God's doing in the life of C3 and be forever connected to the life change, the people who God is changing their lives because of your faithful generosity. So thank you. The first time I ever worked for a church, I was 18 years old and I was hired to be the part-time student pastor at a church, a small church in the town I grew up in Texas that had never had a student pastor. And part of my responsibility was to not only lead the student ministry, but also lead and direct the student choir. And I laugh even as I say that because I don't sing, I can't sing. I, I could probably rap, but I don't think I can sing. And, but I had to lead this choir, and I'll never forget, it was the first Sunday morning during the service that the student choir was supposed to sing a song. And so we were in the choir loft. Uh, I came out, led the student choir. We did the song. And, and at that church, when the song was over, the choir, everybody went down in their seats and got ready. And the message would take place from the pastor. And so you didn't stay in the choir loft. You went and sat down. So the song was over. We went and sat down. The pastor got up and he said something like this. Uh, student choir, that was terrible. I want you to get back up and do it again and do it better. And he wasn't kidding. Like we all had to go back up there, the walk of shame in church and go back up to the car and try it again. And personally, I don't think it was any better the second time, but thank God he did not say, do it again another time. And one of the things I noticed, that particular pastor throughout his life would be fired by five different churches. And before I became pastor, I served on different staffs. That was the first one in different roles, different positions on church staffs for different pastors. And I learned a lot about what not to do in ministry by observing. I learned a lot about what to do. Just like the people that serve with me learned from me a lot about what not to do and also hopefully some things about what to do. But some of the greatest lessons you and I can learn in life is from the mistakes of other people. And there's one person one person, I think, not only in the Bible, but one person in my mind in all of history that sort of captures the title of the one who made the biggest, uh, the most egregious, the most significant mistake. One whose entire life seems like it was a mistake. Nobody names their children after him. No schools or streets are, are ever named after him. No one wants to be like him. And I'm talking about Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. One of the most horrific and tragic stories with a terrible ending in all of history. So what does the life of Judas speak to you and speak to me today? What, what can we learn from someone who made such a significant mistake? I think the thing we learn as we're in the second week of Chase the Noise is this. Silence the noise of control and chase the noise of of change because Judas refused to change. Think about it. He was with Jesus. He saw the blind given sight. He, he saw the lame be able to walk again because of what Jesus did. He saw those who couldn't speak be able to speak. He saw the lepers healed. He saw Lazarus raised back from the dead. He saw it all, but he never changed. He didn't allow what he experienced having a front row seat to the Son of God, he did not allow it to impact him in a way that it changed him. In fact, the day after Jesus had selected all of the disciples and had them all together, he said this in John chapter 6, verse 70, Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. 
he was talking about Judas. Judas started out as a devil. Jesus acknowledges it on day one. One of you is a devil. He had a messed up, broken life, just like we all do. But Judas spent three years with Jesus, serving with him, seeing everything. He had a front row seat to life change. He experienced the power of God in his presence. He saw the presence of God around him, and yet he still ended up a devil. He started out a devil, experienced all of that, and ended up a devil. He never changed. He simply refused to change. He never allowed what he heard or what he saw to change him. That reminds me that it's not enough to just be where Jesus is. It's not enough to just hear the words of Jesus. It's not enough just to spend time with other believers that are following Jesus. The purpose of following Jesus is to let God change your life, change my life. So being a Christ follower is about living the life God created you to live. A better you, a you that's free from everything that holds you back and holds you down, a, a you that is more like Jesus and how you view people and how you're kind and how you're forgiving and how you show love and how you put others first and, and how you overcome the baggage that you carry through life from the younger years. Jesus, Judas perfected hanging around Jesus and being with him on a regular basis yet never being changed. Are, are you good at being around Jesus or being around the things of God? You check out church online and you connect for a moment and you, you think about God periodically and maybe you even pray on the way to work or on the way to that meeting or in the evening when you're processing life or in the morning before you have a day that you think is going to be hard. You're, you're, you're around the things of Jesus. You, you hang around or you hear his words periodically from a message like this or from a friend or maybe a, a memory verse from your grandma that's, that's put on a coffee cup somewhere. Are you around his people yet never changing? To truly meet God, to truly invite God into my life changes my thinking. It changes my attitude. I mean, think about it. If God is God and I invite him to come into my life, there's got to be some sort of change. I mean, God, majestic God, the creator of the universe, the God that is bigger than anything we could ever imagine, the God is beyond, that is beyond that God. If I invite him into my life, there's got to be a transformation that happens on the inside, and I begin to become more like Jesus and what he teaches, and Judas rejected that change. How did Judas reject Jesus? I mean, seeing everything he saw every day, hearing everything he heard on a regular basis, how did he end up not being changed? How was Judas able to be unaffected by Jesus? Maybe if you're a Christ follower and you've studied your Bible, you remember Mark chapter 4. If you're not a Christ follower, you've never read the story. In Mark chapter 4, this lady named Mary pours out an offering on Jesus that's worth a year's wages. And Judas has a problem with it, even though he's one of the disciples. He thinks it's too much. He thinks she's gone too far, and this is too radical of a step. See, Judas had no problem with giving Jesus something. He just didn't want anybody to give him everything. Judas was upset, not that somebody gave something, but that someone gave everything. And when you and I give Jesus something... You can have a little bit of my Sunday morning. You can have a little bit of my week when I talk to you in prayer because I need something. You can have a little bit of my faith when someone I care about is going through something difficult and I'm, I'm seeking you, hoping you'll help. When you and I give Jesus something and not everything, you lose the most important things. Judas was a committed follower of Jesus. He followed him every day for three years. He was there for the miracles. He attended the teachings. He just refused to change. He was unwilling to surrender. And today, if you want to live, if I want to live a significant life, a life that is beyond the normal existence that most people navigate in life, if you want to experience significance in life, if you want to have a significant marriage, a significant home, a significant career, if you want to be blessed financially and relationally, You've got to turn down the noise of control and chase the noise of surrender. What does that even look like? Surrender is, Lord, my life is yours. 
You can have my relationships. You can have my thoughts. You can have my tomorrows. You can have my body. You can be in charge of my resources. Everything I am and have, I turn over to your control. I submit my life to you. I surrender everything to you. And that's not only a one-time surrender on the day that you and I commit our lives to Christ and invite Him to be our Lord and come into our lives. It's not only a one-time surrender on that day, it's also a daily surrender. As He shows me areas of my life that I still haven't surrendered, I have an opportunity to rather than seizing control or maintaining control and me being in charge of that area, and even though I know what God teaches in Scripture, and even though I know what would honor God, I choose to say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this the way I want. It's an opportunity to surrender on a daily basis those areas as God shows me, hey, in this area, you're still controlling. In this area, you still, you're still in the driver's seat. Judas was chasing control instead of surrender. So much control that he even calls worship waste in John chapter 12, verse 7. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected when Mary poured out this offering. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He called worship waste. But worship time is not wasting time. See, you and I, we, we need this. There's something beyond the natural that happens when we engage in what Scripture calls the church, what, what God calls the bride of Jesus. There, there's something supernatural that happens. In, in fact, anything you and I do in place of this is wasting time, but this is never wasting time. You may spend time doing other things, but when we worship, we're not spending time, we're investing time in our relationship with God. We're investing time in our future. We're investing time in learning from and, and, and being with Jesus and others who follow Him or those who are seeking Him. I think that's why Hebrews says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some are in the manner of doing. In the opportunities we have to connect and to allow God to deposit something in our life that is life-changing and, and beneficial to us and those we love the most and those around us, Every opportunity like that we should seize because it makes us more like Jesus. It puts us in a position to live the life God created us to live. And when we do that, we will live the best of life. We will be better at life, and our lives will be better. It's never a waste of time to value the time that God's given me and to give Him the first of that time, the first part of each day, the first part of each week. There is so much noise competing for the first, but if you want the life God created you to live, if you want to be significant, you've got to chase the noise of surrender where we put Him first. See, when you don't chase the noise of surrender, you can, like Judas, know about Jesus, but not really know Jesus. I think of what Scripture says in Matthew 23. And while they were eating, He said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray Me. Notice this. It, it's communion. It's the Last Supper. Jesus is about to be betrayed and crucified. He's having this conversation over this final meal. They were very sad, and they began to say to Him, one after the other, Surely you don't mean Me, Lord. All of the disciples, except one, said, Surely you don't mean Me, Lord. But notice verse 25. Then Judas, the one who would betray Him, said, Surely you don't mean Me, Rabbi. Judas didn't call him Lord, he called him Rabbi. All of the other disciples called him Lord, but Judas uses this term Rabbi, which literally means teacher. See, our world, and I believe our churches, are filled with people who view Jesus as a teacher. Jesus, give me something that will make my life a little bit better. Give me a principle that will improve my marriage. Give me a tip on parenting in a better way with better results. Give me a thought that will help me to be happier or happier than I am. Jesus, teach me a little something for my life. Teach me something, but don't take over. I want to be in control. I, I want to learn from you, and I want you to, to help me live better, but I, I don't want to follow you in every area. Just the areas that are convenient are the ones that I agree with. I, I'll take your teaching as a suggestion and apply what feels right to me, but, but Jesus, don't get confused. I am in control of my life, and I'll determine where it goes. You're just here to make the ride more enjoyable. You're my teacher, but I don't want you to be my Lord. And that's how a lot of us live. Do you view him as teacher or Lord? If you're holding anything back, 
then you view him as a teacher and you're living like Judas. It's only when we surrender. What in your life is it that you haven't surrendered yet? What area of your life is it that you're maintaining control in spite of what God teaches? What are the areas of your life perhaps that you think you know better than what God laid out? It's only when we surrender. It's okay, God, I I give you even this. As hard as it is, as scary as it is, as uncertain as it is, I'm going to call you Lord even in this area. See, when he's teacher, you know about him. But when you receive him, you make him Lord, and then you know him. So how do I know? How do I know if Jesus is Lord in my life? Well, Judas lived his life to the playlist of control, his own beat, his own rhythm. He was in charge of his own life. There was no change. There was no worship. He he was willing to give Jesus something, but not give him everything. It's interesting to me. Jesus knew that in three years, Judas would betray him. But for three years, Jesus refused to expose Judas for who he was to the others. Jesus gave Judas the same opportunities he gave the other disciples. Jesus gave Judas one opportunity after another to change, one chance after another, just like he's giving you and me today. Have you ever wondered, I've thought about this so many times, have you ever wondered why Judas betrayed Jesus? Why would he do such a thing? Many biblical scholars believe the reason Judas betrayed Jesus was not for Jesus to be crucified. In fact, many biblical scholars think that Judas never thought Jesus would be crucified. He turned Jesus over because he thought at that moment when they came to arrest him that Jesus, remember he'd seen all of the power, Lazarus raised from the dead, the walking on the water, the, the, the turning of water to wine, the people that had been healed. He'd seen all that power. He thought Hey, if I push the envelope here, if I get them to come after him, then Jesus is finally going to rise up, start a revolution, and usher in the kingdom of God. Judas was just probably trying to help God speed things up a little bit. Judas was trying to push Jesus into doing what Judas thought he should do. Do you ever do that? Do you ever in your moments in life Try to help God out with something. Try to make happen what you think should happen. When we chase the noise of control, we often try to hurry God up into doing what we want Him to do in our lives or in the lives of others. The greatest surrender is often in the waiting. And the only thing worse than waiting in your life is wishing you had waited. We've got to learn to chase the noise of surrender. Where do you need to chase the noise of surrender in your life specifically? Where are you still calling Jesus teacher and knowing about him, but not really knowing and experiencing him because you haven't called him Lord in that area? Where are you still trying to control your life? Is it with your time? You need to give him the first part of each day, the first part of each week. Spending the first part of each day, maybe reading some scriptures and spending a moment praying. The first part of each week connected with a local church, allowing God to deposit some things into your life that are difference making. Where do you need to give God control, to chase the noise of surrender because you're still controlling your life? Is it with your money? You need to give him the first of all your income. The Bible calls it the tithe. And scripture teaches the first 10%. If you're a follower of Jesus then we follow the teachings of Jesus because we make him our Lord. He gets the first 10% of my income. It goes to the local church. And I've discovered, just like so many others and many of you, I live far better on 90% blessed by God with God's partnership than living on 100% of what I make without God's blessing and provision in my life. See, it's an issue of control. Is that an area that you need to surrender? Where's an area that you're still controlling? Is it, is it the area of forgiveness? Hey, you need to surrender that, that, that pain, that circumstance, that betrayal, that thing that happened. It doesn't mean it erases what, it happened, what happened. But you've got to give him the pain and you've got to trust him for the consequences. You, you've got to release it to him so that it doesn't control you anymore. Because when you don't forgive, it changes you. And not in a way that you want to live. Where are you still in control of your life? 
Is it your habits? You've got to give him control by seeking the help that you need in those areas. It is not weak to say, hey, I need help. It's one of the strongest and most courageous things you could ever do. Where are you still in control? Is it the desires of your heart? You've got to give him your desires. You've got to ask God to guide you and to shape you. You've got to say, okay, Lord, I want you to be Lord even of my desires. And the ones that are not honoring to you, the ones that don't fit in your perfect plan for my life, God, would you please change those desires? Would you please reshape those? Would you please point me in the direction that would honor you? See, God is God. And because he's God, he doesn't just want something. He wants everything. And because he's God, that's what he has a right to. God is not interested in part of you. He wants all of you. Where are you still in control? Is it your life? Because today, you can make the decision to chase the noise of surrender and surrender your life to Christ. To truly know Jesus in a personal way and not just know about him. I want to invite you to pray a simple prayer with me. Just bow your head right wherever you're watching. Bow your head, close your eyes, and if you'd like to chase the noise of surrender and surrender your life to Jesus today, if you've never taken that step, I want to invite you to pray a very simple prayer. Just right where you are, head bowed, eyes closed, just say, Dear God, I know that I need you. Jesus, please come into my life. Please forgive my sin. As best I know how, I commit my life to you today. I surrender to you. I want you to be my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you look at me? If you just prayed that prayer, I'd love to know that. I know you're watching online. I want to invite you just to shoot me a quick text. Just put your first name and shoot the text. That's all you've got to send is your first name to 407-487-8311. I'll get that list of names this afternoon, and I would love to be able to pray for you by name. I'd love to be able to pray for you by name throughout the week. So if you just prayed that prayer, please let me know that. I'd also like to be able to send you a free gift. So shoot me the text with your name so we can reach out connect with you, and get that gift to you. Also want to make you aware, Mother's Day is right around the corner. Mother's Day is coming up very, very quickly, May the 9th. And on Mother's Day, we're doing something very special for all families. We're doing free family portraits for everybody. You've just got to be at C3 on Mother's Day. Also, that same day, we're doing a child dedication in each service. You might say, what is that? It's a time if you've never had your child or your children dedicated A time in the service that's very, very special where we'll be able to pray for your kids, pray for you, ask God to bless you, give you wisdom as a parent, ask God to protect, provide, and and speak to them and draw them to know him personally. A very special time in each service, but you need to register for that. So to do that, just go to c3church.cc forward slash now. You'll see all the information there about the child dedication, about the portraits for Mother's Day, other things happening in the life of C3. So be sure and check that out. And then if you are watching for the first time today, I told you I'd love to send you a gift. If you'll just pop over to c3church.cc forward slash VIP, there's some contact info you can fill out there. I'd love to send that to you just as a thank you for hanging out with us today. And we'd love for you to join us in the room next Sunday. We'd love for you to experience one of our gatherings at 9, 30, or 11. I'd love to meet you. But man, I I hope you have a great week. Know that I'm praying for you. I pray God blesses you, and I hope to see you next Sunday. Have a great week.